Good morning. I'm here to talk about a new world model. It's called the Earth for All model of human well being on a finite planet covered the year 2100. My friends and I have written a book, a new report to the Club of Rome, celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the 1972 report called The Limits to Growth, which was actually the first report to the Club of Rome. And this uh, new report is called Earth for All. And it will appear in September 2022. The report looks at what is necessary in order to increase the well being of humanity during the rest of this century. That is the object to try to reach a world where human well being, the well being of the working majority, is better than it is now. The report is largely verbal. It's written in words and for the lay audience, but it is supported by the Earth for All system dynamics model. Uh, this one uh, can be described as an early example of a new class of integrated global assessment models. It is a model that includes both the human world and the natural world and the interaction between the two. It is based uh, on the system dynamics methodology and consequently it is a causal simulation model. It is not an optimization model where one is trying to optimize GDP or some other indicator of human well-being. Uh, it is rather a model which is capable of generating a number of internally consistent scenarios for the next 50 years. Or to be precise, the model is able to generate forecasts for those variables we are interested in, in the global system. It's not a model of the world, it is a model of those phenomena we're interested in. And primarily, that is the development of human well-being over this uh, period. The perspective of the model is much like that of World Tree, uh, which was the model that was supporting the Limits to Growth book 50 years ago. Uh, 50 years after the Limits to Growth, we can conclude that the world has followed basically the forecasts of the or the scenarios in the limits to growth book so you can see here uh, on the slide four of the 12 scenarios from uh, the limits to growth for population developments from 1972 to the 20 2100 and overlay is actual development of the world during this period and you see that the population has grown, it's essentially doubled over this period and followed uh, the starting point of most of the scenarios in limits to growth. And in the same way, uh, you see that industrial output has actually increased over this period. You can see how the human wealth being has been developing over this period, interesting, you know, the black dots starting now to indicate the leveling off in average human well being measured as the human development index uh, during the last uh, decade or so. And the big question is how is this going to develop further? So we have seen growth, we have not yet seen the collapse that occurs in some of the more famous scenarios from the limits to growth. 
So what will happen to uh, well-being during the next 50 years? Will it continue to decline? Will it grow? Will it oscillate? That is the real research question, and this is the question we're trying to elucidate using a new system dynamics model called Earth for All. It is interesting then to say that we, when we are talking about well-being, we are not talking about average well-being of the whole population. We have split the population in two groups, workers and owners. So workers are roughly the 90% of the population and owners are those that make more in a year than what they spend and consequently have the resources available for investment. So, uh, and so the goal here is to increase not the well-being of the totality, but primarily the well-being of the 90%. And we should remember that at this point in time, of the 90%, 95% belongs in the global south. So this, with the 8 billion people we are at this point in time, the West and the rich world contains 1.5 billion. The other, you know, six and a half billion is the audience, essentially the, the majority of the audience for the study. Since the presentation of this model is unbelievably long, it in written, it ends up being a several thousand pages. Uh, there is very little I can do except trying to compact this into something which is short, but then of course omits many of the most interesting details. Those are available easily for those of you who can run models because the, run, the model is available in Stella and in, in, in Benzin. And uh, you call me and you get the model and then you can of course do all the checks and balances and change the assumptions as you want. Uh, my presentation today is going to last for another 52 minutes uh, in order for you not to fall asleep during this. Uh, uh, I start by showing you uh, an aggregate result. So this is a relatively high level causal diagram of the model. Hopefully in another 52 minutes, you will know a little bit more about what are the main uh, variables, what are the main causal relations, but you can see already on this model uh, up in the corner, the population sector, left-hand corner, population sector. In the middle, you see the private sector, which is the private part of the economy. Then there's the public sector, which is a separate uh, entity. Uh, you have the, the labor market in the top, you know, how owners and workers fight over the worker share of uh, output. Uh, to the right, there is the ecological footprint is the human use of energy and food and its impact on temperatures. Uh, to the top right hand, you see the integrated well-being uh, sector. And down in the left-hand corner are all the financial uh, aspects of the economy, which typically are much more short-term and which I will only mention at the end of the presentation once uh, or if. I have the time when we get that far. Uh, and the model runs very nicely. It's uh, typically the base run uh, looks like this. It matches history from 1980 to 2000. And then it calculates the effect essentially of uh, it's parameterized in such a way that it uh, matches the history from 1980 to 2000. And then we assume the same decision style being kept during the next 80 years. So that means that there are no truly extraordinary action in the base run. You know, the truly extraordinary action beyond what we have seen uh, over the last 40 years is then in the policy uh, runs. You see the population growing, peaking, declining. You see the GDP per person.
person continuing throughout. Uh, you see global warming, the black line, you know, the world getting warmer and warmer throughout the whole period. Uh, you see inequality, the, the gray the line, you know, increasing, but with a 10 year oscillation, which is the fight between the owners and the, the workers. This is the Marx growth cycle for those of you who know uh, your history. Uh, and then there is uh, the green line, which is the average well-being, the well-being of the majority, which grew, you know, over the last okay. out of the last 40 years. It's now stagnating, and in the model, the base run, it's actually declining for the next 50 years before it levels off at a, a relatively low level. And again, with oscillation depending on distribution. So you might ask. Is this possible? You know, is it possible to make a model that can say something meaningful about human well-being on a 50-year horizon? Well, at least we have built the model and it generates reasonable results. So that's the, the first step. The main answer why I believe this can be done, and my colleagues believe that this can be done, is that we have found in Data and in the qualitative history of the past, uh, information uh, that shows or data that shows that there is a surprisingly stable relationships between human behavior and the GDP per person in the society that they are living in. And I will, and that's in many ways the basis for our forecast. We assume that the human beings of the future are going to behave when they are different income levels in the same way as they behaved over the last 40 years. And let me show you an example of this. So here in this graph, there is fertility, it's the birth rate along the vertical axis, and it is the wealth, the income of the, the GDP per person of the nation along the horizontal axis measured in PPP uh, dollars, 2017 PPP dollars. And you see, these are now for the 10 regions that we have split the world into. And you see the yellow line is basically our general assumption based on the underlying data, namely that you start with a high birth rate when incomes are low, and then you move towards ever lower uh, birth rates when incomes rise. You see very helpfully here how good, or I should rather say bad, that approximation is. You see how China looks very different, the red line being way below uh, the average development, while the United States is staying with its very high birth rate due to the reasons that we all know. And so, you know, there is variation. So this is a typical example of the heroic assumptions you need to make if you want to try to estimate roughly what will happen to well-being in the future. But the point is, there is apparently a clear systematism as people get richer, as women get richer, they choose to have fewer children. And then I'll show you very quickly five others of these. These are in many ways the core of the predictive capacity of uh, a model like this. So here you have uh, the economic growth rate, which illustrates the fact that as when you're poor, the growth rate is very low. Then while you industrialize, you know, the growth rate is very high and then it declines as you get richer and richer and actually gets very close to zero uh, in the end. Uh, the savings rate, for those of you who are interested in the macroeconomic parts of this, interestingly, also has a pattern where savings rates decline after as you get richer. Very interestingly, it means that people actually consume more as they get richer, which is contrary to one of the graphs shown uh, yesterday in the conventional view. Uh, the capital labor ratio, again, interestingly, seems to increase more or less linearly with income. The government share of GDP is another, you know, very important decision made by societies. And of course, here, tradition and political choice 
makes a bigger variation among the regions than in the other graphs. But still, there is this obvious uh, tendency that, you know, initially there is no state, then gradually you reach a peak state, and then uh, it tends to, to, to decline. Clearly, if we decided to act differently, you know, one can, of course, decide to have higher taxes and a bigger government. Uh, and then move away from the yellow line. But we use the yellow line to the, the global guide to do the surprise-free future, you know, the base run of the model. Uh, here is the energy use uh, in, per person, which is amazing. This is now the sum of electricity and fossil or heat measured in proper units and added together in the way it should be. And look what it shows, is that amazingly, when you reach 40,000 euros, uh, dollars per person per year, you know, the energy use per person does not increase anymore. So there isn't, so here, this is the Kuznets curve in the real, you know, for, for those of you who know what is the Kuznets curve. Uh, if you look at CO2 emissions per person, here, the spread is very big, but there is again the tendency that it levels off. It is the reason why the country curves decline is that there is technological advance. So that those uh, countries that were at $30,000 per person a year in 1960 had a lower energy efficiency than those that are at the same dollar value at this point in time. So you can improve adaptation here much by introducing explicit uh, technological advance in the graph. Fuel, fossil fuel use, again, increases with rising mm -hmm. income. And that is it. So these are, you know, if you want to, answer in one short answer, how good is the model? It is as good as the approximation that we do when we replace actual developments with the yellow line. This means that the dynamics of the model are reliable, but the numerical values, you know, totally without for, you know, reliability. It also means that we are building, I'm presenting to you now, the one global model applied to global data. But we are at the same time adapting it to the 10 regions. And so when you go down at the regional level, you replace the yellow lines with the continuation of the actual data for the region, and thereby you get a better fit. It turns out, luckily, that the difference in the two ways of calculating the global aggregate, either doing it in this heroic manner or doing it as the sum of 10 regions gives the same result within you know, the uncertainty range that I have indicated, namely that we only rely on the dynamics in the system and any type of numerical value is plus minus you know, 50%, plus minus 30% in, in, in that uh, order of magnitude. So we want to forecast well-being. We need a definition of well-being in order to do this quantitatively. And what we have done, we have chosen to define the average well-being of the working majority in the following way, depending on five components. Those are by the recommendation of what is called the We All uh, Alliance, of uh, the well-being alliance of nations that have chosen to move away from GDP per person as the societal goal. They are using the average well-being as their goal. And our concretization of the five goals of the We All uh, Alliance are the following five. So the first component is worker disposable income, so per person after tax, measured in 2017 PPP dollars per person per year. The second component is public spending per person, 
you know, basically saying that if there is a strong state, expensive state that provides health, education, transportation, etc., this adds to the well-being uh, of people beyond their disposable income. The third one chosen by we all reasonably is inequality. <clears throat> so uh, clearly, an unequal society is less happy than an equal society. And the way we measure inequality in the model system is to take owner disposable income after tax and divide it by the worker disposable income after tax. So you get the ratio between the owners and the, and the workers. The fourth is uh, environmental quality. And here we use observed global warming as the indicator. We could have added many others, but for simplicity and also because our ability to forecast climate is much higher than our ability to forecast some of the other uh, environmental damages. Uh, we use to observe global warming in degree centigrade above pre industrial times. And then, fifthly, in order to indicate what we all call participation, you know, the engagement in society, we use something we call perceived progress. And basically, this is the rate of increase in well being during the last five years. So, this is the simple idea that if uh, well-being is going up, people are happy, they have hopes for the future, and they are not as disgruntled and do not cause as much difficulty for the government as they do when well-being is declining and people are getting increasingly frustrated and starting to rebel. In greater detail, in the next slide, I'm not going to spend time on it, I just show you the equations for how we calculate the worker disposable income, the public spending, the inequality, the environmental damage, and the perceived progress. And the important thing here is that you do not, not need very many variables, you know, in order to be able to calculate future values uh, of the average well-being index. So I've highlighted them in red. You need a GDP forecast. You need a forecast of the worker share or output. You need worker tax rates. You need the transfers, <laughs> governmental transfers from the rich to the poor. You need the workforce. You need the national income. You need the government gross income as share of national income. You need the population. You need owner income after tax, worker income after tax, observed global warming, and rate, growth of, rate of growth in the average well being index. This is not many variables compared to the endless number you would have thought was necessary. It still is a large number of them. And the art in the rest of my presentation is to try to get you to feel, you know, how coarsely do we approximate these, uh, I guess it's 10 uh, red variables. And the, way I have chosen to do that after a lot of attempts is to actually go into the model and then look at variable by variable, comparing it. So looking what it looks like in the base run from 1980 to 2100. I'm comparing with history, which is the blue line in this case. So that's actual data from the real world. And then to the right, I indicate a few of the major causal influences that actually determine the graph to the left. It's easy on this first one, which is population, which of course grows as long as you know, fertility is higher than mortality. And as the number of desired children goes down the blue line to the, to the right, because society gets richer, because there is more health, because there is more education, because there is more contraception, because there is more opportunity for the women, you know, uh, finally, the population starts uh, to decline because. And so this is the perspective of the model on the population side, and you see the unbelievable fit uh, to, to history, you know. Not very, you know that, that's, this is, of course, way beyond the precision level of the model. It just shows that it is not that difficult when you have a basically correct theory for what's going on to parameterize it in such a way that it fits uh, history. 
GDP growth is somewhat more interesting. This is the GDP of the next uh, you know, past 80 years. Uh, you see the red line, that there's GDP growing. You see the, those of you who know systems can see both the inventory cycle, you know, the, the four year business cycle, and you can see the 10 year cycle. So this is a superposition of both the long-term growth the 10 year mark cycle and the four year inventory cycle. But it basically goes up. It grows in a model and at, to the right, you see in the red line, how the growth rate is actually declining over time as one would expect since the blue line showing how the GDP per person is increasing throughout the period. You see to the left, the mismatch between uh, the growth rate in GDP and the observed the growth rate, uh, growth in GDP, which I have left there just in order to indicate, because it's of course very easy to just adjust one parameter in the system so that the two match perfectly. But that hides, you know, the level of heroicness in all of this. And so it's, I've left some of these things just in order to remind you all the time that this model is an incredibly rough approximation to the humongously complicated reality and that exists out. Let's proceed to workforce. So this is the workforce doing the same thing here. You see the market's growth cycle much better. You also see them to the right. The reason, you know, this is the capital labor ratio in the system, uh, which is, you know, how many machines basically there are behind each worker. This is the one that worries people with the robotization of the service sector, you know, which means increasing the capital labor ratio very quickly, which means that unemployment rises faster than it otherwise would have been. The worker share or output is the red line. This is the share of the GDP that actually ends up as salary to workers, and it tends to decline you know, over time. Uh, the government share of GDP in the model system declines because of the yellow line showing that as you get richer, the, the role of the, the government tends to decline. Here you see that historically average for the world is down to roughly 17% uh, of the GDP, while we have parameterized the model uh, at 22. But again, this is the type of thing we can easily change by reducing the tax rates in the system than by reducing the size of the government sector. I leave it here to be able to make that point. Again, if the two matched, you will never have thought about the fact that, you know, this is of course uh, changeable. The public spending per person, the red line to the right, increases throughout and is one of the real drivers of our well-being in uh, this coming century. The inequality index is starting to be more interesting. You see inequality rising both historically, here the data is the Gini index that is most commonly used as a measure. Our red line is of course a totally different measure. It's the ratio of owner income to worker income, but they have the same trends. And the reason for this is of course the declining taxes over the last uh, 40 years, which we assume in a model system will not be continued. That's of course a heroic assumption. Uh, one could of course in the base run assume that taxes, that liberalization is going to continue over the next 80 years. I don't think so. And so consequently we have chosen to assume that humanity is you know, moving away from the liberalization move that has occurred over the last 40 years and into, we basically say, a stable situation. Okay. Energy use grows like the red light, interestingly reaches a peak, uh, roughly 30% above current levels because the energy use per person in the system defined the way we define energy. Yeah. Electricity use, the same thing, you know, so the task at hand for the 
climate people is basically to build enough sun and wind, you know, to produce uh, you know, 12,000 megatons of oil equivalent uh, converted into terawatt hours of electricity uh, per year. I should, for pedagogic purposes, of course, have had electricity measured in terawatt hours of electricity instead of megatons of oil equivalent. There's a factor of four between the two. And to the right, you see in the base run how the fraction of low carbon electricity is just the amount of sun and wind uh, and hydro and nuclear. That is uh, part of, of uh, the equation. And you see, even in our base run, where we assume decision making along the lines, the same style as during the last uh, 40 years, that fraction actually uh, reaches 50% in the 2050s. So that's my surprise free sur uh, forecast. Our surprise free forecast is that by 2050, we will have roughly half of the world running on renewables and one half of the world running on, on fossil fuels still. And then, of course, once you know all of the stuff that uh, we know, here comes the CO2 from energy and industry. You see the emissions rising from you know, the approach. So rising from the roughly 15 gigatons of CO2 that was emitted <coughs> in 1980 and to double that value roughly, the, what is this, 30, 32 uh, gigatons. Uh, our surprise tree forecast basically believes that we will reach a peak in CO2 emissions relatively soon, that, uh, and then decline. That comes out of all the assumptions that uh, I've gone through this far. And the main reason is, of course, the CO2 per GDP, which is you know, the energy, the true uh, climate efficiency of the economy, which has come down dramatically since 1980. That's, those are the historical numbers from 65 or 0.65 kilogram per dollar of, of GDP down to 0.38. And we assume, you can see the, the thing, uh, the, the point uh, around 2020 where it accelerates this shift. So we do believe that there will be some deviation from uh, traditional decision making on this, uh, in this particular case. And the result is then global warming. Uh, the red line is model output. The blue line is what has actually happened over the last 40 years. Once more, we have deliberately included a difference between the two because it is easy to go into the climate model, just twist a few knobs of, of things that people don't know what is and get the two curves to match perfectly. Uh, so this is again a reminder, and the reason why this uh, the global warming occurs in the model is of course that the CO2 concentration increases in the model system, like in the real world. And the CO2 uh, crop use here, the red line. Uh, so interestingly, we assume like we did in our former studies three years ago and 10 years ago, that the world will only need roughly 30% more crops, you know, at the peak than it needs now. Uh, and uh, that is the red line, which is our forecast. The, the historical data here is the blue line, which you see is way above the red line, the red curve. The reason is, of course, that the blue line is FAO statistics, and they define crops in a different manner than we do. And consequently, <laughs> if we multiply our definition of a ton of crop with 1.4, we get the green line. And that's what is the difference between the two assumptions. Why do I include this thing here? It is to make the point that the FAO statistics on food, which is the best we have, are wildly uncertain, internally inconsistent, and there is everything wrong with the FAO data. And so matching those data 
does not really make sense when you're building a causal model. But we show here what types of patches you then need to do if you want to satisfy the demand from the masses that your model should fit history. So again, I include this in order to highlight you know, how difficult it is to actually try to make a model. And then to the right, you see what drives uh, food production. It's fertilizer use per person, and it is the crop use uh, per person. Cropland, one needs land in addition to fertilizer in order to produce the food. And you see that over the last four years, since we wrote the, the Limbus to Growth book and made the I made an agriculture model in, in limits, you know, cropland has been relatively stable at 1500 mega hectares. The reason why we have been able to increase the food production dramatically is, of course, increased use of fertilizer. So that's the, what has happened in the past. And you see, going forwards uh, in the base run, we will need some more cropland because we have reached uh, saturation, basically, in the use of fertilizer in parts of the world. And that means that we will need to cut the forest. So you look to, the, to your right, the, the forest area, the blue line, which is the an indicator of the remaining biodiversity is actually declining, while the urban land at the bottom and the mm -hmm. wasteland, which is not plotted, are increasing. So we are in the process shifting you know, from undisturbed forests uh, to, to destroyed uh, land. And then finally, uh, we reach uh, the, uh, the sum of the pudding which is the average well-being index. And you see, as you have gleaned from the earlier ones to the left, that the average well-being index rises during the first, you know, 1980 to 2010. And it basically declines until 2050 and stays at a low level. And this is, of course, because income, disposable income and public services per person are increasing. So that's the positive that pulls it up. And the negative thing is, of course, the warming that goes up and inequality that it's warming that goes up and inequality that goes up. And so it related the two negative effects overwhelms the positive effects and you get a decline in, 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 in well-being. It levels off because gradually the warming levels off and also the inequality starts to level off. So. <laughs> If you're on the model far enough out, probably the well-being uh, will start to increase again. And I'm then including on the graph to the left also what happens to GDP per person in order to make the following point. Notice that over the next 30 years, we will be in a situation where the GDP per person grows because the total productive activity of uh, per person, labor productivity is going to continue to rise. While at the same time, the new indicator is going down. So this shows, this is included in order to show how useless it is to use GDP per person as an indicator when you want to improve the well-being of the uh, human being. Uh, to the right, we have the important uh, indicator, the social tension uh, indicator, the blue line. And the blue line is basically, as I said before, the derivative of well being. So when well being is rising, you know, you see social tension going down. When well being is starting to decline, you know, between 2000 and 2050, uh, the well being, the, the social tensions rise. And then they stay at that high level, you know, during the rest of this uh, century. In sum, you know, when do you then want to present the, the total result? There are, of course, a couple of hundred variables in the system, so it gets very messy. Here you have at the top the six variables that I indicated initially, the population, the 
growing GDP, the global warming, the inequality, the average well-being, and the social tension. And now you should know a little bit more about how we calculate those uh, variables. At the bottom, there are some other indicators just for the use of you. The, the blue line at the bottom is the one that interests most people in the South. This is the number of people that are below $15,000 per person a year in GDP. $15,000 in GDP per year per person is the level necessary in order to satisfy the sustainable development goals. So, so societies that are at $15,000 typically satisfies most of the sustainable development goals using conventional decision techniques. What is $15,000? Interestingly, it is the GDP level of China. So China is now exactly at that point. The world average is also at 15,000, which is also interesting. Uh, Europe is at 50,000, the United States at 60,000, Norway even, beyond this, and, and uh, then India and Africa, South of Sahara are down into the, you know, two to four thousand uh, dollars per person. So it's a wide spread between uh, the regions. But the sum of this is a population that below 15,000, that is, has come down a little bit during the last 40 years and will actually uh, decline to zero during the next 50 years or so. That's our best forecast for the speed at which poverty is going to disappear uh, in the world. I've spoken about the energy use that peaks in red, the crop use that peaks in green, the government share of the GDP that rises a little bit because they start to spend money on what is necessary to save the world, uh, and the fertilizer use going down because of the essentially effect to try to reduce waste, to make the transition to red meat and to introduce regenerative uh, agriculture at the speed which is profitable, you know, which is a low speed, but it helps. And then finally, the greenhouse gas emissions, the black line shows the surprise free uh, development where we peak relatively quickly. We cut of the order of, what should I say, 25% uh, by, by 2050, and then another 30, 40% by the year 2100. So this is, of course, way below what is the ambition of the Paris Agreement and the global society, but we don't believe that they know uh, what we're talking about, basically. They're not going to implement the solutions we think that, uh, that uh, they are promising to implement. So what can you use a model like this for? Uh, the most obvious thing is, of course, to, to, to try to look at policy intended to reverse the, the trend in, in well-being. So the model says that in the price-free future, you know, well-being is actually going to decline. The great variation between the regions, but basically now both in the rich and in the poor. So the purpose of, or one purpose of the Earth for All project is of course to promote a political program that is intended to improve the well-being of the working majority of the planet during the next 50 years. Uh, there has been a huge debate in the project about what are, what level and what are the types of, of the policies that should be included in this package. We have, after a lot of debate, ended up on, with five turnarounds. There are five transformational changes that needs to be done in order to get to a better world. And it is the, they're called the, the, the poverty turnaround, the energy turnaround, the, the, the food turnaround, the empowerment turnaround, and the inequality turnaround. I'm presenting them here in a more model-based uh, sequence, you know, and it, which is easier to understand than the political program that will be, you know, presented in 
in words in a way that is easily understood. So we first, the first idea is to eliminate global poverty. That means to get the blue line of the number of people below $15,000 uh, to fall more rapidly. And it, the way we do this is basically to use new growth models instead of following the liberalization, the Washington consensus, the old fashioned development strategies. We are following the role of Guatemala, Costa Rica, you know, China. So more plan and less markets. So you do what Norway did between 1945 and 65 when you basically built a nation according to plan instead of letting it be dominated by uh, the market thinking. The second thing is to stop climate change, which is very simple. It's simply to replace fossils with wind and sun efficiency and carbon capture and storage. The third thing is to halt biodiversity decline. You know, so how do we do this? Introduce regenerative agriculture to protect the remaining forests. So we basically insist that one should manage with existing land area uh, and existing uh, fertilizer use, and then uh, rather reduce waste, reduce red meat, reduce uh, and accelerate, subsidize regenerative agriculture. Mm. On the fourth, I call it stop population growth. This is not politically acceptable language in the very international group that uh, we represent. And so there it is called empowerment of women. It is exactly the same thing. You know, it is supplying education, health, contraception, and opportunity to all the women of the world, which has two side effects. It makes the women happy. And secondly, it makes the women choose to have very much fewer children so that we reduce the consumption pressure in the long run so that we don't simply have a solution for the current 8 billion people, but that we actually get the population down during the next 40 years. And then uh, the final one, uh, reduce inequality, which is terribly simple. It's simply to make the rich pay for the higher well-being of the working majority. So you take from the rich and give to the poor. And here it is important to mention the main numbers. The fact is that the cost of doing all of this is, we say, somewhere between 2 and 4% of global income. And so if you got hold of 2 to 4% of the money, you could then pay for the shift of labor and capital from dirty activity to clean activity, from what is profitable to what is needed in order to make a better world. And the numbers are such that the 10% riches in the world control 50% of global income. So all you need to do is to slap a 10% tax on the 10% riches of the world, and you get the 2 to 4% of the GDP that you need to pay for this uh, program. Of course, this is what we propose. This is never going to be accepted, but at least it is important to make people aware that if in a democracy they were smart enough to band together, you know, the 90% that would you know, not be affected by the tax rise, you know, then we could solve the problem for everyone. Here is the detail in how we represent those uh, policy changes in the model system. Not particularly interesting at the level we are now. Very interesting when you start discussing policy implementation, you know, how do you actually get the money out of the rich? You know, uh, etc. Uh, then I want to show you what. So, what is the effect of doing this in the model system? So, here uh, you see the red line. Uh, the, the blue line is the base run. The base run in our publication is called "Too Little, Too Late." It is a story, you know, which has been given a name, which which. Uh, tries to describe the central characteristics of, of that um, scenario. And the base run is very well described as humanity reacting too little, too late, you know, to the onrushing 
challenge from planetary boundaries. You see with a giant leap, which is the five turnarounds that we are proposing, uh, you managed to eliminate global poverty at least by 2060. So you managed to, to accelerate this by 30 years. And largely you do that in a model system by applying new development models instead of repeating, you know, the, the as I said, the liberal uh, ideas. Uh, inequality, you know, we do manage to move from the, the blue line too little too late down to the uh, giant leap. The size number of children. So here you see the effect of introducing health, education, contraception, et cetera, you know, from the blue line down to, so instead of ending up around two children per woman per reproductive life, we get it down to one and a half, which is enough, of course, to make the population decline yeah. somewhat faster. The total forest area, there isn't very much we managed to do with the loss of biodiversity, but at least it's better than nothing. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So here you see the spectacular decline that is possible if you just accelerate the investment in wind and sun. So we managed to get greenhouse gas emissions down to zero by 2050. Then please notice that it is negative throughout. This means that in order to make uh, a future which is this desirable, we need large scale carbon capture and storage or direct air capture of, of uh, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. If you don't do this, you get a much higher temperature at the end of the century. And the average well being index, as a consequence, moves from the blue to the red. So at least we get you know, more or less business as usual the next 30 years, you know, with the level of social tension that we have. And then uh, well-being will start to rise uh, at the end of the century because of the removal of poverty, because of the lower warming, because of less inequality, etc. So that's the social tension, the development, you know, lowered from the blue line to the red line. Uh, what will it cost to do this? I spoke about the aggregate cost. Here you have the time profile of the cost, which is much more interesting, or, and also looking at different measures. Uh, so the cost of energy, and look at the dynamics here, because here is finally a dynamic consequence that I think is reliable and is interesting. So you see in the, in the two, So there, sadly, the coloration is wrong. So you see in the, in the, uh, the blue line shows the, the too little, too late uh, mm -hmm. scenario where the cost of energy is of the order of $4 trillion uh, per year, uh, keeping relatively stable and then declining towards the end of the century. If we introduce the giant leap thing, you know, the accelerated introduction of <coughs> Uh, sun and wind, we increase the cost. We add roughly $2 trillion per year, which is 2% of the world GDP, but it only lasts for like 30 years before the operating cost of the sun and the wind is, of course, much lower than the operating cost of the fossil alternatives. So you end up, you know, having a time profile where you invest yourself out of a problem and then in the long run, the next generation harvests. The time profile here is, of course, politically incredibly important because, of course, it makes it very unlikely that we will do this because the benefit from the increased cost comes 30 years in the future. Okay. Those people that are worried about the GDP per person that we will actually have lower economic growth in the future if we implement those uh, policies should be assured by the graph to the right, which then basically shows that you are, that you do get a uh, uh, higher GDP per person uh, if you do this. It's very sad that the label too little too late should be colored here, blue, and the giant leap red. That's a pedagogical 
uh, disaster, to say the least. But uh, we will see what we can do about this. And then the lower things basically indicate what economists would be very interested in. You know, so what we're doing when we use labor and capital to solve problems that are not profitable is actually to deliberately lower productivity, lower labor productivity. So moving people from high productivity to lower productivity activity. And in macroeconomics, this is the total factor productivity, which is the variable, which is then basically lowered a little bit uh, in this scenario in order to you know, reflect the real fact that by working against the market, you're putting people, taking people that currently do very productive work into somewhat less productive work. Uh, what will it take? Well, more collective action paid by the rich is the summary. You know, to, to, so how do we pay for it? We pay for it by taxing the rich. And that's what this graph basically shows. And in some, again, we have the giant leap scenario, which looks like the spaghetti uh, here. It basically tries to convey the message that in the model system, it is possible to turn around the declining well-being by acting on those five fronts that I have indicated. Whether this is then possible in the real world is, of course, the interesting question. I do think that if those actions were implemented, I think our forecast of the consequences is relatively precise. So the big question is, of course, will we be able to implement uh, strong action along with giant leap? My personal belief is that we will not. I am a deep pessimist on this score. Luckily, the team in general are totally different. They're much younger. And they have the belief that if we just communicate this message well, you know, we will be able to convince uh, a political majority to pay what it costs or to introduce the legislation that is necessary in order to get the five turnarounds changed. I'll just mention so you know it is here. In the background, there is a financial sector that I haven't spoken about at all. The main reason why I don't speak about it is that it has no impact in the long run. This irritates, of course, the financial community. But uh, so we have here, you know, the, the, the whole uh, financial sector. So the inflation rate is, uh, is brown. The unemployment rate is blue. The central bank reacts to the inflation rate and to the unemployment rate and gives the central bank signal rate, which is the green one. The government borrowing rate is slightly higher than the green one, and the corporate borrowing rate is slightly higher than this again, and the worker borrowing rate is higher again. So the only thing which is important here is that the financial sector accentuates the 10-year wave in the struggle between owners and workers by doing exactly the opposite of what they ought to do. So the, the current system is, of course, set up you know, according to what I just read, in order to try to lower inflation and lower unemployment. Uh, but it works in the model system exactly the other way around. It just helps, you know, making the 10 year fluctuation uh, in the economy much sharper. <laughs> and this is easily observed. You know, we are now in the middle of one of these financial downturns. 10 years ago was the uh, financial crisis, and 10 years before there was the uh, uh, dot-com thing. So in our model, and notice here that the time horizon of this plot is down to 20 years. So these are the short-term inventory imbalance uh, type of, of driven uh, activities. Then there is the summary of the main assumptions, and this this can, of course, be made very long, but it's good as an end to all of this because, you know, so what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to build 
one generic model that can then be applied to 10 regions. But we want one model. The second thing, the precision level is low. You know, you need to stress this. Only dynamics are reliable. Three, the population is split in workers and owners. Four, the economy is split in a private sector and a public sector. Five, there is a dual perspective on the economy. There is the real economy in the model and there is the financial economy. They, they are separate, you know, which is very important when we get into that detail. Six, energy is split in electricity and heat, and heat is the direct use of fuels with or without CCS. Crops are split in food and feed. Land is split in forest land, grazing land, crop land, urban land, and wasteland. And very importantly, and not mentioned this far, investment is split in A, investment in productive capacity, and B, you know, what the financial sector is really involved in, which is investing in paper, in financial assets, which, you know, like gold, real estate, and paper. And what is going on in the United States and elsewhere now is, of course, that we're getting a bubble, which is driven by the fact that the huge investment flows in the United States are no longer going solely into real assets, they're going into financial assets, which is a bubble that will break. And so that's the short-term forecast of the model is that we have a financial, we're in the middle now of a financial crisis. Once we're out, it all will start again. And in 10 years time, we will have the new next Minsky instability, which is the uh, technical word. I think I, this is of course the way in which you should try to remember the earth for all mode. Because of course the, the one hour of explanation is impossible. But here you see what is basically going on in our uh, system. So we have the average well-being in the left-hand corner, which is influenced largely by disposable income to the right and observed environmental damage. So it's the positive thing from economic growth. It is the negative thing from the effects of the footprint. Then the disposable income comes from output, the GDP, but so does the observed environmental damage. It also comes from emissions, biodiversity loss, which comes from the use of energy, food, and materials, which of course moves in parallel with the output. So when output increases, yes, we get that positive effect on average well-being because of income, and we get a negative effect on average well-being because of the footprint increase. Luckily, society is somewhat rational, so the public policy action to try to do something about the negative aspects, you know, so the observed environmental damage uh, influences public policy action, which actually does two things. You know, it increases regulation, subsidies, etc., which increases the rate of gaining, but below, this is important, Public policy action tends to come with increased taxes, and that highlights perhaps the most important distinction in this analysis, namely between tax-financed government spending on public well-being, on the one hand, and the profit-driven investment in productive activity on the other side. So when you want to make a modern and much more accurate macroeconomics theory, this split between that activity, which is policy driven, you know, tax financed government spending on public well-being on one side and the profit driven investment in productive capacity on the other side is important. And the interesting thing is that both of them increase the GDP. You know, so the worker that is working on a low productive capacity in order to clean something is also added to the GDP. So that the fact that both of them work on the GDP is important. The net taxes influences savings, which reduces the, uh, the 
profit-driven thing. And then the spaghetti in the middle, the rate of greening is what is important there is the learning involved. So when you start investing in a green solution, you know, over time you accumulate volume and the costs go down. And this determines, you know, the green fraction. And to the left is actually the vicious circle, which basically says that when average well-being goes up, the perceived rate of progress goes up, social tensions go down, and the average well-being goes up. But this loop, you know, uh, also drives the trust uh, into the public policy action. And if you look at the whole schmear, you run the risk of trust decline. That, you know, the self reinforcing negative spiral, which says that well being declines, which means that social tensions rise, which means that trust in government goes down, which means that the government can no longer. Wrap it up to get ready for the next one, okay? okay. We try to take these. Yes, Sarah, and Sarah, we need please. to transition. Sarah, please. Five, 10 minutes. No, 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 it's 10 minutes over. I'm sorry, you'll need to wrap it up. I can log in remotely and do it. So the point is that it, it, the negative spiral of declining trust and declining ability of the government to do something then leads to a further decline in well-being which may be uh, leading to what we call social collapse uh, in this system and that is of course the thing we really need to avoid. Thank you very much for listening me out. This is a hard job. Uh, you will get on the web, you know, the model. You will get the thousands of pages of description, which you will never read, but it will probably exist. And uh, that is it. And I wish you all the best with the next 50 years. Maybe not the time for. Are you happy to take questions? Like? Well, we take questions. Yeah. Until they're yeah. aggregated. <laughs> 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 Just the volunteer setting up. So, oh, okay. so we have 20 minutes. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please do. No, no. <laughs> so we are continuing the question and answer session. Yeah. Those who need to leave, but just do it quietly. Did you use uh, into account or take your inspired of uh, knowledge index uh, methodology uh, defined by World Bank? Like this the second question is. Uh, how many decision makers or policy makers are familiar with your model? No, zero. Zero. No, no. So on the first one, you asked whether we had used a special technique. The answer is no. Uh, on the second one, how many decision makers are uh, familiar? familiar with your model? Yeah, zero. Of course, there are a couple of hundred senior. Uh, economists on our, uh, let's call it,